We've been in this series discussing the rubble in our own lives, maybe broken down walls that God wants to rebuild and lead us to rebuild. And through that, we've been looking at the historical story of the nation of Israel rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem that had been destroyed when Babylon had taken them captive. Uh, And Nehemiah, the leader, one of their leaders, was the one who was kind of taking on that effort and moving them to do so. And throughout, we've seen sort of this progression. So when I'm in the midst of rubble, my heart has to be stirred if I'm actually going to do something about it. I have to be stirred to care enough to want to change what is broken in my life. And once it's stirred, I move to prayer. I begin seeking God to say, God, what do you want to do with this? What's your plan? What's your agenda? What's your goal? So it's not my desires and my structure. And we see that Nehemiah for, for months prayed and fasted and sought God's direction. And as God begins to lead and direct, we need to be ready to move when he moves. When he opens the door, we need to be ready to walk through that door. And as Caleb shared last week, once we start to, into that process, we need to make honest assessment of where we are. And I think many times we're not honest with ourselves, we're not honest with the situation, and not being honest, we don't really know how to handle the situation or what to do because we're kind of disregarding the issues that exist there. We need to be honest. We need to make an honest assessment, and in that honesty, make the proper changes. It makes me think of what Jesus' brother James wrote when he said, it, it could be like a man who looks at a mirror and then walks away and does nothing about it. You know, if I'm not ma- being honest in my assessment and then choosing to do something about it, then I'm not actually going to get where I need to be. But the truth is, once I've journeyed through all of that, I can, I can be stirred to do something about it. I could spend time in prayer. I could be ready to move and make honest assessment. But eventually, somebody has to act. Eventually, somebody has to do something to rebuild what is broken in their life. And you and I eventually will have to act. At some point, we have to do something. And I think too often, we sit in the rubble of our lives, unwilling to do the hard work to rebuild. And I'll be honest with you, it is hard work. It's going to be hard work. Anything that matters in your life, anything that's important, it's going to take hard work to make sure that it survives or to rebuild if it's broken. But too often what we do is we dismiss that and we dismiss the hard work and we look for an easy route out of it. We look for the easy way to escape it and we decide to either just sit in the rubble and accept it or to run from the rubble thinking that that's going to solve the problem. I think that we end up in our minds believing there are only two options. If I'm in the midst of the rubble, I have the option to just sit in it. This is my life. This is what's going to be. I'll be miserable for the rest of my life, or I can run from it. But the issue is running from it doesn't fix the problem. Running from it still leaves the rubble. And perhaps running from it may create more rubble in the process. There is a third option. And the third option is that God begins breaking down the rubble in your own life to bring healing and change so that you can repair what is broken and find something new. I'm not stuck with just the option of sitting in it and running. There is the option of finding actual healing and change. It makes me think of a story I read a while back in Thomas Costain's book, The Three Kings. He talks about the three Edwards around the 1300s in, King, in uh, England. And in the, the book, he tells a story about a man named Reynald, Reynald III. And Reynald became king, I think, when he was really young, maybe six years old or ten years old when his father died. And he was very self-indulgent. All of his life, he was self-indulgent. He grew very heavy. The people in his community didn't like him because he was self-indulgent. And they would call him by his nickname, Crassus, which meant the fat. That's how they defined him, how they spoke of him. Well, eventually, Rinald's younger brother, Edward, Edward fights against him, overthrows him, and puts him in prison. Now, that's not uncommon. That's happened throughout history. But what was unique about that situation is his younger brother put him in a prison that had open windows and an open door. But he built the door just small enough that his... Young, his older brother, Renald III, could not squeeze through the door. And when people would accuse him of being cruel, this is what he would say. My brother's not a prisoner. He may leave when he so wills. 
But every day he would send him delicacies. And rather than leave that prison, Renaud would stay in that prison until eventually his younger brother is killed, he's released, and then he dies a year later because he actually got heavier in that prison. That might be where you are, where you think you're imprisoned. You feel imprisoned by the rubble of your life. And the truth is, you can leave when you will. You can make changes the moment you choose to make changes. You can do something about the rubble in your life. Here's my bottom line for you this morning. Nothing gets done until somebody chooses to do. The rubble will remain. The walls will stay broken until somebody says, I'm not okay with it. I choose to act. I choose to do something about it. Now, we're going to dive through Nehemiah chapter 3. And maybe if you're reading through Nehemiah, you hit chapter 3 and you're like, this sounds a whole lot like Leviticus or Numbers where there's genealogies. This guy gave birth to this guy and this guy gave birth to this guy. And you just skip over it because you think there's nothing there, there's no value. What I want to show you is that I think there's a ton of great depth there and there's really powerful direction for rebuilding the walls, doing something to rebuild the walls that are broken in our lives. One of the things that you'll see consistently is that Nehemiah says over and over and over again, they began rebuilding and repairing. At the beginning, Nehemiah 3.1, it says, the high priest, Eliashib and his fellow priests began rebuilding the sheep gate. And as you go on from that, you just see that term, those two terms, rebuilding, repairing, rebuilding, this guy rebuilt, this guy repaired. So maybe the doing for you is to build something new. What new has to be reshaped in your life? Sometimes we can't just start on the old foundation. We have to tear down. When you think about their rebuilding effort, they had to go remove rubble first. They had to remove the rest of the broken walls first to start over. Sometimes we have to go further down before we can build back up. And and building on the same old habits, the same old patterns, that's not the solution. We need something new. It's like Jesus said, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. You need a whole new structure. And maybe your foundation has been crooked. Maybe in your relationships, in your marriage, your foundation has been crooked, and now you're feeling the weight of that. What you need is to build a new foundation. But what we think often is that I just need to run. So I've been learning a lot of things recently, studying a lot of things. I want to say to you this. When I'm talking about building new or finding something new, maybe you're thinking that's a new partner you know what, this old partner isn't working. I'm going to get a new one. You can get a new partner, but if you haven't dealt with your pain, all you do is take your pain into that new relationship. It's why second marriages have a higher percentage of divorce. It's why third marriages have an even higher percentage of divorce because people don't deal with their pain. They just carry their pain with them, enter a new relationship, and they're still broken. You have to deal with the hurt. Something new has to be shaped. And I'm not saying a new person, a new partner, build something new with what God has given you. I'm not saying go back to the old brokenness. But through hard work and honesty, God can rebuild something in that relationship, but it starts with healing. It starts with getting rid of the old patterns or the old habits. Maybe it's repairing. A lot of times there's things in our life that are good, they've just faded, or we've forgotten, or we've lost sight of them. They don't need to be destroyed, they need to be repaired. If I have smudges on the wall of my house, I don't rip that wall down and build a new one. I repaint it. I refresh it. Jesus spoke to the church in Ephesus and he said, go back to your first love. Go back to your love of me and your love for one another. He actually says to them, He says, remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at verse. Remember what you used to do. Remember the passion you used to have. Maybe when you first came to faith, remember the things you did. Change and go back to those things. 
Not start over. Sometimes there's things in our life that we just need to repair. Sometimes there's things that we need to rebuild. But something has to be done. So what do we do? We'll do what's next. As Nehemiah structures the rebuilding efforts of the wall, he specifically sets everybody up in a counterclockwise way so that everybody's building on what the person before him is building. But for each person, it's what's my job? They're not thinking about everything else. They're not thinking about the grand scheme of finishing the wall. They're just saying, these are the bricks or the, the, the rocks that I have to put into place. This is, this is what I have to do next. And if you're like me, and you find yourself in broken wall situations, all you want to know is how do we get to the finish line? How do we fix this? But so often when we think about the big big task, reaching the goal, we freeze because it's too big for us. It seems so unmanageable. What, What we really need to do is what's next? What's the next thing that God has called you to do? What's the next best thing that God has called you to do? It's why our mission as a church is to help people take their next step. You may be so far from God, you don't even believe he exists. What's the next step? You may have been in faith for 40 years. What's your next step? It's not how do I get to the end. It's what's the step God is calling me to do right now. Take your next step. I remember reading years ago, Nick Saban, coach for the Alabama college football team. Nick Saban would say to his guys, do your job this down. Don't worry about the scoreboard. Don't worry about the end of the game. This down, do your job. If you do your job this down, the scoreboard will take care of itself. Now, the guys figured something out because he's won a whole lot of football games and a whole lot of championships. I remember hearing a reading a long time ago that a manager for the Braves or the owner for the Braves was asked, what's your mission? When you talk to your, your managers, you talk to your players, what's your mission? He says, get people on base. That's it? Well, yeah, the goal is to score runs. You get people on base. They can move around the bases and score runs. You win games. But what he was doing was simplifying for his people, like, What's the thing, what's the next thing we have to do? Simplify it. Nothing gets done until we do, so do the next thing. Don't be frozen by the bigger picture that's too far beyond you. Don't be unwilling to work. Do the next thing, but don't be the one who's unwilling to work. In Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 5, we read that certain individuals were rebuilding a section of the wall, but then it says, but their nobles did not lift a finger to help their supervisors. Now, Nehemiah doesn't name them. He doesn't say why they didn't work. He doesn't explain any of their reasons or excuses. But think about it for a moment. This happened thousands of years ago. We're reading about it today, and in the history book of what occurred in the city of Jerusalem thousands of years ago is a story about a group of individuals who weren't willing to do any of the work. I'll tell you, I don't want to be in that part of the story. If there's rubble in my life and there's things that are broken down in my life, I don't want the story of me to, say, to be, yeah, there was work to be done, but he wasn't willing to do it. Don't be the person unwilling to work. Don't let that be the history of your life as you look back or others look back and they say, you know what? Something could have changed, but they weren't willing to do anything to change it. There could be a lot of reasons we're unwilling to work. Maybe we say, it's not my fault. I didn't cause this. It's not my problem. It's not my responsibility. I shouldn't have to do something about it. I don't like the plan. It's not a good plan. You know what? I I really just don't care. And we can justify not working. We can dismiss not working. We can be downright unwilling to work. But what will the history say? I recognize that many of you you, you are sitting in rubble in your life because you have been in pain. Because of something that's been done to you. 
something you've experienced and you've been living in pain. And until we deal with that pain, we just carry it along with us. And running does not take away the pain. Being unwilling to do something about it doesn't take away the pain. You know why pain exists in our world? Because of sin. And there's a reality that if there's sin in your life and sin in my life, sin needs to be repented of. I confess to God that it is what it is. It's a sin against you and I seek change. But the pain that has come to you because of sin, here's where the church, I think, has failed too often. You may say, like, we can address, and the church has historically addressed and called people to repentance of sin, but you might be saying, I have pain, I'm hurt. And if I were to say to you, repent of that, you cannot repent of sin, or you can't repent of pain, you only heal pain. Pain is not repented of, pain is healed. Guess who heals it? Jesus heals pain. Running doesn't heal it. Ignoring it doesn't heal it. Stuffing it doesn't heal it. Jesus heals it. That was his very mission. In Luke's gospel, Jesus, quoting the prophet Isaiah, speaking of himself, he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He says that my mission and the reason that the Spirit of God has empowered me is to heal broken hearts. I've been convicted about my own ministry and how much of my years of ministry has been to fill minds. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to offer theological knowledge to you. That wasn't the mission of Jesus Christ. His mission was to heal broken hearts. And I know that in this room and listening at home, there are broken hearts. And you may think running from it is going to fix it. It's not. You will just carry that pain with you. But there is a healer who wants to fix it if you're willing. A man who had leprosy went to Jesus and he said to Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Guess the beauty. Jesus says, I am willing. Be made clean. He's willing are you? I want to say to couples, you're here, you're married, struggling. I believe God loves marriage. He established it. He established it long before any king, any government, any patriarch. God established marriage, and he loves it, and he hates divorce. And his desire is is that we would be healed if our marriages are struggling. He's willing, are you? I listened to a testimony the other day, this lady sharing that struggling in her marriage, didn't know if it was going to work out, and she's sitting with the pastor, and the pastor said, do you believe that Jesus, that God raised his son from the dead? She said, yeah, I believe that. Of course I believe that. I said, no, I don't, you're not hearing me. Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? Yeah, I I believe that. He said, so help me understand this. You're saying to me that God had the power to raise his son from death to life and offer life to all those who believe in him, but he does not have the power to raise your marriage from death to life. That's what you're telling me. And all of a sudden, it opened her eyes. She recognized what it truly meant to believe and found restoration in her marriage. Are you the one who's not willing to do the work?
Don't be that person. Take ownership. If you go back to Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1, we read that the priests were the first to start in the work. You know, here, here, they're the spiritual leaders in the community, and they're not sitting there saying, yeah, that's not our job. You guys do it. You take care of it. We'll just kind of sit here in the temple. And they took ownership. They put their boots on. They grabbed their trowel. They went to work too. If you're in a position of leadership in the rubble of your life, own your leadership. Do what God has asked you to do in your role of leadership. But as you read on, you'll find that, God, or that Nehemiah starts putting people in sections that were close to their home. Now, I'm going to read some names, and here's, here's just my theory. I don't know how to pronounce all the names all the time, so I just say it with, a, with as much confidence as I can to make people think I know what I'm talking about. So that's just what you do if you're reading names in the Scripture. But here's what we read. It says, Jediah, son of Hermoth, made repairs across from his house. Hashabiah made repairs for his district. Merimoth made repairs to another section from the door of Eliashib's house to the end of his house. Benjamin and Hashab made repairs opposite their house. Azariah, son of uh, Messiah, made repairs beside his house. What's happening here? Nehemiah is really, really smart. We're in a rebuilding effort to rebuild the defenses of our city. We're rebuilding the walls. He goes to you and says, you know what? I don't want you to worry about the whole wall. I want you to worry about this wall that's right, right outside your door. How important is that section of wall going to be to you? Nehemiah understands that if they take ownership of what's right next to them, what's important to them, they're not going to take that lightly. They're not going to phone it in. They're not going to use cheap material. This is in front of my house. You better believe my section of the wall is going to be the best section of the wall there is. Nehemiah is super smart. He's calling them to take ownership. So by doing what's close to them, that's our challenge too. Do what is close to you, what matters, what's of greatest significance. We often get caught in the rebuilding efforts of the grandiose, the things that are so big. Listen, you should care about world hunger. I should care about world hunger. I am not going to eradicate it. And what I do is I allow those grandiose ideas to keep me from focusing on the things that are close to home, the things that actually matter, the things that should be done. Because, oh, I got these big things that I got to work on that I'm never actually going to work on. Own what is close to you. Own what is yours. And understand that you cannot own what is someone else's. You may be in the midst of rubble, and there are other people involved in the rubble. You can't own what is theirs to own in the rebuilding effort. And the longer you stay in this place of, well, they need to own this, the the longer you keep yourself from owning what is yours to own and doing what is yours to do. Own what is yours and let God deal with them and owning what is theirs. The Apostle Peter had that struggle. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he's walking on the beach with Jesus, another disciple named John, and Jesus begins to display to Peter everything that he's going to go through in his life in endurance for Jesus. Reveals to him that it's going to be tough, he's going to suffer. It's going to be persecution. I imagine for him, it's like, this isn't the greatest prophetic vision of my future. I'd rather something else. But after hearing this, he turns and looks at John and he says, Lord, what about him? What about their part in all this? And Jesus says, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. Don't worry about him. Worry about you. Follow me. Do what you know I've asked you to do. And don't get caught up in owning what is someone else's and failing to own what is yours. Don't work alone. All throughout the text, if you read, and I love to show you, I've got all kinds of different color codes, like knocking out all these different ideas. 
If you read through it, you'll see over and over, and he worked next to him or by them, and he worked next to him and by them, and this guy worked with his daughters, and the priest worked together. Now, obviously, it's this flow of construction so that the work gets done in a rhythmic, uh, natural way, but I think it's also revealing that nobody worked alone. Nobody was doing it on their own. They had people around. Every one of you knows that you'd be in a really, excuse my, crappy job. And if you have somebody around you working with you, it can make it a little bit easier. The time can go by a little bit quicker, depending on who that person is. You've worked with some people like, oh, man, they're on a schedule. It's going to be a long day. But there are other people that you could work with. It just makes the day fly by, even if it's a terrible job. Because working with somebody, it just allows us to, to do more, allows us to, to kind of enjoy whatever, the, even if the work is hard. So don't work alone. Surround yourself with people who can help you, who can encourage you, who can support you. Somebody who will say, don't give up. Somebody who will remind you that it's better to work than to run. Somebody who reminds you to focus on what is yours. Somebody who will tell you the hard things, the things you don't want to hear. Don't work alone. We're not called to work alone. And in doing so, we should build off the work of others. As I've shared in the past, experience is a great teacher. Young people, experience is a great teacher, but it's not the teacher you want for everything in life. I don't need to experience everything to know that I don't want it. I'd rather learn from the individuals who have been down that road and by God's grace have made it back. Here's my theory. The wise learn from others. Fools have to learn on their own. Scoffers know exactly what they're going to learn and choose to go that road anyway. Learn from others. And don't be alone in the work. Ecclesiastes writes this. Solomon says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm, but how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Here's the beauty. If you are in Christ, the Spirit of God indwells you, and the Bible says you will never be alone. He will always be with you. But God is not, you may, you may think running from people and being alone is the solution to your broken walls. God seems to have a different theory. And he calls us to not be alone when it comes to others, no matter how hard that is for you to hear. We're not called to be alone. We're not called to work alone. I shared this with my daughter this week. And this is the beauty of God's care for me and his care for you. Reading through Psalm 139, just thinking about the heart of God. In Psalm 139, David writes about how God has crafted him uniquely, knit him together uniquely in his mother's womb. He expresses that he can never escape God's presence, that God is always chasing after him with his love. But then he makes this statement. He says, God, when I consider your thoughts of me. So David is considering God's thoughts about David. He says, if I were to number them, they would be greater than the sands. Now think about if I handed you a bucket filled with sand and you counted every grain of sand in that bucket, you couldn't do it. David says, God's thoughts of you. You want to know if God cares about you? You want to know if God thinks about you? The God of the universe thinks about you more times than all of the sand on the planet. I can't make sense of that. Because for me, I feel so unworthy, so, un so insignificant to think that God thinks about me that much. I sent a text to my daughter, and I showed her that verse. And I said, whatever you face today, you need to know that the God of the universe is thinking about you that much. You are precious to him. 
No matter what anybody else says to you, you are precious to him. He cannot stop thinking about you. So many of us hurt because we've never felt true love. The God of the universe offers that love to you. He will never leave you alone. But he also asks that we are not alone with one another. Here's my last challenge to you. If nothing's done until somebody does, give everything you have. Give all you have. If you're going to do, if you're going to act, if you're going to say, okay, I'll try to rebuild the walls, don't do it half-heartedly. Don't do it with hesitance. Give all you have. There's an interesting statement here. As, as Nehemiah is speaking about different people building, he speaks of one individual, but he throws in a little tag that, that indicates there's something unique about him. He says, after him, Baruch, son of Zabai, diligently repaired another section. It's the only place that that word's used in the text. That word could be translated angry. Now, I don't know if necessarily he's angry in his work. Maybe if he hit his thumb, you've all been there where you're working and something made you angry and now you're angrily working. But the word can also mean on fire, There was a fire lit under Baruch to say, I'm going to do something about this, and I'm not going to be half-hearted about it. I'm zealously going to change the brokenness that's in front of me. That for Baruch, he wasn't doing it half-hearted, skeptical, partial, doubtful, reserved, or hesitant. He was all in. And if God is calling you to restore something in your life, he's saying, go all in. It makes me think of Paul's beautiful words about love in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, love bears all things. It carries the weight. It believes all things. It's optimistic. It's not skeptical. It's not saying this could never happen. It believes all things. He says love endures all things. It perseveres. It fights. It hopes all things. Love never fails. That word fail, it means that it does not fall off. It does not fall down. It does not run aground. It doesn't weaken. This type of love keeps sailing, keeps running, keeps pushing, keeps fighting, keeps building, whatever it takes. And I imagine you've never felt that love. And when we never felt that love, we don't know how to give it. The God of the universe loves you that way. His love never runs off. It never runs aground. It never weakens. And it never leaves you. And it's in that love that he says... Give everything you have. Be like Baruch in the broken walls of your life, not like Jehoash. There's a man who was a king in the nation of Israel. His name was Jehoash, and he went to Elisha the prophet to ask him to bless him. And Elisha said, okay, here's the process of the blessing. Grab your bow, grab your arrows, and I want you to shoot one out the window, and that's an indication of your fighting against your enemy, and then I want you to strike the ground to indicate how much victory you're going to have in your life. And we read in the text, Jehoash struck three times and he stopped. That's the key phrase. And Elisha becomes upset and he says, you should, have, you should have shot five or six times. Notice that to Elisha, the number isn't what matters. It's that he stopped. He says, you should have. And if you did, you would have had far greater victory than you have now, but now you will only. Those are three phrases I don't want to define my life. Should have, would have, and only. All because I stopped. All because I didn't shoot every last arrow I had in my quiver. Give everything you have. In your marriage, with your kids, with your parents, in your work, in your relationships, give it all. 
If you are in a broken, rubble situation, give everything you got. It's worth the risk. Nothing happens until somebody does something. Nothing ever gets done until someone chooses to do. And the reality is you and I cannot do on our own. We need God. We need a strength that's beyond us. But God has already begun to do what you and I cannot. He took our sin that we could not pay for and he paid for it. He took our unrighteousness that we could not overcome and he wore it so that he could give us his righteousness. He did what we could not do in restoring our relationship with God in heaven. And he continues to do what we cannot do moving forward. The Apostle Paul wrestled with a thorn in his flesh, a weakness that he had, and he cried out to God and said, God, take this away from me. Three times he said, God, take this away, to, away from me. And every time God said, no. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. So Paul says, if that's the case, then I glory in my weakness. You may be in a position in your rubble and you're saying, I can't do this. I'm tired. I don't have what it takes. Just be willing. Because Jesus does have what it takes. He never grows weary. And he can do what is impossible in your life. Alistair Begg said this once. He said, if dependence on God is the goal, then weakness is the advantage. If he is the only one who can do what I cannot do and his power is shown in my weakness, then weakness is my advantage. Rely on him. He wants to rebuild what is broken in your life. Let's pray. Father, I ask that we would not be written in the history books as those who were unwilling to rebuild what you wanted to rebuild. That our marriages and our parenting and all the spaces that you've called us to, that we would not be written down as the individual said, no, nah, it's just too hard. I don't want to do the work. Father, I pray that we would depend, be dependent on you and understand that you have offered the same strength that you utilized to raise your son from the dead. Father, you've offered that to us to rebuild what is broken in our lives. And I pray that we would choose to do. That if you stirred our hearts and you revealed to us in proper assessment the things that are damaged and what needs to be done, that we would choose to do not run, not try to medicate our pain, but find healing from it and step towards the life that you've called us into. I pray this in Jesus' name.